Melissa Mark Viverito yes. is the Speaker of the City Council. She also represents a district, a district in East Harlem. We have her here with us. She's always very kind to respond Thank to you. our requests. And also, if you're checking out the Somos official guide, which is here, make sure that you read out Somos as a vehicle for change. It's an op-ed that she wrote for us. Um, you don't pull any punches. First of all, welcome and thanks for joining us at City and State TV. Muchas gracias. You know Michael already, our yes. executive editor. I don't. Um, you, 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 you don't mince any words. You go straight to the point. You see Somos as a, as a vehicle for change. What is the change that you're viewing, not only from the city perspective, but you also have to deal with legislators. You come up to Albany often enough, and you know that uh, you got to knock on their door, got to try to get as much for the city. Some of it we don't get our fair share. Where is it right now in this budget process from your perspective? And, what you need to get back to the city for the entire city to deal with the uh, municipal legislature, right. which is the city council. Well, I think, first of all, I think that um, these forums are always important, whether it's the legislators' conference that we were at in Feb back in February, now. These are important moments to galvanize as a community and really develop an agenda of priorities. Now, with regards to this budget cycle, yes, I mean, we're in the last couple of days of this state budget cycle. I'm glad to hear that there's been some conversations about changes, like the ethics reform stuff, the shape that takes, obviously. Um, I, de I definitely would like to see a little bit more transparency in how the budget is negotiated. I think that that's something that uh, is really important moving forward, that there are more voices that are part of that process. Um, but I think that, you know, we are concerned. We're up here with 14 council members earlier this week, meeting with Paul Hasty and meeting with Stellos and meeting with on the agenda that is important to us, minimum wage, talking about, we've been talking historically about getting state contribution to public housing, which thankfully we're starting to see some inroads into that. Some other way, you know, rent regulation is going to be coming up, it's not part of the budget, obviously, uh, but that's very Thank important God. that they hear from us that we want a renewal of our rent regulation laws and to strengthen them hopefully. Um, so we laid out a really comprehensive agenda and being able to interact with SOMOS, with other caucuses to really make sure that they hear from us and that they help, that we can help them uh, push those issues forward is, is what this is about. The, 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 what's the receptivity in terms of these different areas? Is there one that you have to push more on, they just don't get it, or is it across the board that you have to fill them in on everything and make a case for everything? No, I mean, no, I think there's a level of, of unity, right, on that. But, you know, we are the legislative body for the city of New York, so we obviously have very clear positions that we wanted to state. Obviously, the debate on education reform is very big right now, right? So uh, we wanted to make it clear that we were not in favor of the receivership proposal that's out there. Right, that was really um, critical. That we wanted to see again, as I mentioned, the money for public housing. We would prefer that it go directly to the city. They want to put it through a state agency. Understood. Um, you know, but that's something that again we were not in favor of. So we, there was there were things that we clearly, really, in, in that are at the heart of what this budget negotiations are centered around. That we wanted to make clear our voice was very present in that. So those are some of the immediate issues that are of concern. And you run into this problem all the time: is that as a progressive city government. You need Albany to get a lot of things done. I mean, the way that the government's been structured over the years is just that Albany has so much power over the city as far as rent, as you mentioned, and, and just in funding strings. Mayoral control could, you know, probably will get re-upped, but at the same time, like, that was something they had to be fought for. Um, how do you navigate that? I mean, it's, it's again, like, you know, the Senate Republicans seem to be like the foil for everything that you guys want to do in government. So, so do you try to make inroads to build those bridges or do you just state your positions and kind of say like, this is what we believe and we're going to stand up for it and fight for it. And if you don't disagree, we're going to try to get you, knock you out of the office. Well, relationship building is important, but you know, and we have a very clear vision as a city of where we want to head and where we want to go. Yes, there are things that we can legislate and we can put in place on our own, but there are those areas where, yes, we do need the state authorization. And, you know, we are in a situation where as much as relationship building we want to build, we do have a Senate, you know, that is not in favor of the direction that we want to go in. And so it's proving to be a challenge in certain areas, but we do have an assembly that is strong. We have a great new, you know, leadership in the speaker, and that, that voice is very firm, and we, 
are united and we want to make sure that we figure out ways that we can support um, the assembly as they negotiate this budget moving forward. And there's room for some negotiation and there's some room for you know uh, getting some things accomplished uh, in these last couple of days and let's see where it takes us. And I know that the assembly put um, some of the settlement money aside for NYCHA yes. improvements. It's something that the assembly um, has been pushing, but the governor and the Senate haven't said that they want to do it. Is that something that you're going to kind of continue to I believe the governor is committed to it. He okay. had put $25 million originally in the executive budget. You know, I've spoken to him personally about it. We put it in our agenda. There have been other voices, obviously, a Senator Klein and others that have also. So thankfully, I think we're in a point where we're actually, since 2007, um, you know, we haven't seen any money in the yeah. state budget for, for NYCHA, you know, that we are going to make inroads and it's looking like, a, a you know, 200 million possibly, 100 million, uh, let's see. Uh, obviously nowhere near enough what we need, but it's a big, big step forward as to where we were before. So that is a victory um, and that's where, you know, the constant organizing and the constant mobilization and the consistency and the voice uh, of New York City is one that I think we, we get some results. So I'm glad that that voice is being heard. On the area of edu in the area of education, um, there is always the disconnect of what policy is versus the politics, which we've had too much of, and right now we're not sure. Uh, I I'm sensing from a lot of people, including some legislators, that, that the governor um, doesn't get it, that he just doesn't understand the education process and what's been there. Some have been openly critical. What's your assessment of what the governor is now, and, and there's even a movement now for some uh, uh, charter schools to come and support his position, and, and it's all being played out in commercials and ads, and and uh, is the, does the governor really get it in terms of what the education uh, crisis is and, and what the need is? I call it a crisis because I don't see this getting resolved right now. So, look, the, the and, governor and, and, clearly has a very strong position as to what he wants to implement. There are those of us that are not in favor. We, as a city council, are not in favor of, of the vast majority of those positions. The receivership, we say we say no. We don't want to see an expansion in the charter school cat. You know, in the, in the number of charter schools. Um, we have concerns about what he's presenting regarding the evaluation of teachers. All of that, we, we've expressed a position on it. So, you know, he has this position. I had an opportunity to interact with him when I came here earlier in the week, and I said, look, the same way that Bloomberg, as prior mayor, was given the opportunity to fully exercise, right, the mayoral control aspect right. and hold ultimate accountability, this mayor should be allowed to do that within a period of time. He's putting changes in place, a chancellor that many of us are being able to work with. We're starting to see some reforms being implemented that are gonna hopefully turn our schools around. So right now in the middle of that, after one year of office for this mayor to come in with this idea of a receivership model, I think defies what the idea of mayoral control is about. You know, accountability lies with the, with the mayor at the moment. Um, we believe there should be an extension of mayoral control, but we would like to see some municipal oversight more oversight given to the city council, uh, so you know that's that's room for that. But we would we would like to see that to happen. Maybe not happen right now. Two, three years. Let's see. Let's for one Give term, one term implement it. If, the, if we don't start seeing a turnaround, maybe we can talk about a Did change. Did you see any headway? Did, did he actually get into? Or are you smiling already? So I already have the response. <laughs> no, I mean we, we went back and forth. So we went back and forth. You know, I'm glad that I had an opportunity right. to. to to be heard on behalf of my, my uh, colleagues and the city council, and let's see where we are. I know that the assembly seems to be very strongly uh, expressing concern about it as well, right. so we might be able to come to a place where um, we will give a little bit more breathing room to, to the city. Another place where there's been difference between your position and the governor's position has been the minimum wage, and the certain yes. level to go to. It seems that what you guys want to do probably is not going to happen this session, but is it, do you, do you view it as a process or do you view it as like you need the minimum wage to go up now to $13? We, we are strongly in believe, you know, first of all, that, that we should, we believe that conversation should be happening locally. Yeah. You know, we should, as, as an opportunity with the business sector, with the business community, with the council members, with advocates, we should be able to engage in that debate. You know, I'm not in any way interested in telling Buffalo you know, based on their standard of living and the cost of living, what their minimum wage should be. I have no idea, right? I, I, I have no knowledge of what their local economy and their local challenges are. I know that that's a conversation we can have. 
and as the speaker of the legislative body, that's a conversation we want to have, and we shouldn't be able to be able to exercise that control. So we want to see a higher wage, and we would like to see it more immediately, right? And there's been a lot of back and forth on whether it's going to be 11.25, 11.75, whatever it ends up being. Um, we still don't think that's enough and we would like uh, some municipal control in order to make that decision. What do you think eventually was going to happen with the minimum wage? Do you think there'll be a level of uh, an agreement, a settling, not what you want in the There's middle? There's going to be an increase. I believe they w there will be an increase. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's going to be what even the governor originally proposed. It seems like maybe the Republican pushback may bring it down a little bit, which is of concern. There we go again, right? So we, we believe that it should be, you know, more than $12 an hour. You think it'll be incremental that maybe that's a uh, negotiation? I mean, that's the thing about whether it's the cost of living adjustment, whether it's inflation, you know, pegged to the inflation, all that. I just don't know where it's going to end up at this point. And just to be clear, I mean, you, you wouldn't, I mean, you, you personally and also the council, the mayor, you would say you wouldn't be placated by like a small, like a raise that's like $12, for example. Like, you're going to fight for what you want next year if the raise is only slightly what it, what you are proposing at this point? Or would you think that there is a compromise you can say like, all right, this is good and we can revisit this in four years? I mean, I, I this is an area where I think it's, it's we have to be really firm. I mean, we are talking about great economic challenges. We're talking about inequality, structural inequality. That's why all the changes about universal pre-K is so critical to really setting a foundation for our children so that they can succeed. That's why raising the wage of low-wage workers is important. So, I mean, all of that is going to help us achieve more, you know, greater equality. And we have seen, again, we've seen in other municipalities where the increase in a minimum wage has not negatively impacted the local economy, right? So we gotta, we gotta, we gotta keep firm and stand firm on those issues. The last, I mean, one of the, the last thing I'll say is that the one of the concerns I have, obviously, is, is the Dream Act. That we continue to really, uh, unfortunately, not see much progress on that front. And the, what do you think is going to happen? Well, the Senate Republicans have been very, very, very clear that this is an issue that they are not going to bend on. And, uh, you know, the, the sentiment out there, or what they've been saying, is that they won the majority based on campaigning against it. Yeah. So it's become a matter of principle for them, and that's very unfortunate. It's being misinterpreted, um, it's being misconstrued, and this is really going to hold back New York State in terms of our economies. If we're not working to create an equal playing field, you know, and that we're providing, we're trying to uh, hinder educational opportunities for our young people, that's a real problem. We, we spoke to the state controller yesterday, we spoke to Assemblyman Francisco Moya, we spoke to everyone we spoke to, they seem to especially Francisco Moya, and, and, and he seems so optimistic, This is, but, but the reality is that we may see a replay in which the governor really, really gets to walk away from it blaming the Republicans. Do you feel that the governor hasn't been strong enough supportive on this in terms of this? I mean, I know there's a reality on the other side, but there are ways to do it. I mean, he's, he's spoken more forcefully on his support for the DREAM Act. Uh, my understanding is that there have been attempts to try to, you know, peg it to this educational right. tax credit as a way of making it more appealing. Um, you know, but in this case, I have to say, I mean, I, and I met with the Republican leadership too. They are dead set against it, and if that's being discussed in the night in that room with the with all the people negotiating it, um, and if that's an area where they're not going to compromise, there's really very little place to go. And I'm not trying to be pessimistic; I'm just trying to be realistic based really? on what I'm assessing. Um, it really is make or break for them. So this. even if it makes sense in terms of what the investment is and the return, they're playing po the politics all the way. All the way, and and it's completely being misrepresented. You know, this is about creating an equal playing field. Nothing is being given to anybody. It's just allowing these young people to have access and to apply and to be eligible for the same resources any other student will be eligible for. So um, it really is critically important. This is about the future, not only of these children. These children represent the future of the city and represent the future of the state. They are here to you know, work and to provide and to provide their um, brain trust to moving us forward, and we're limiting that potential. And that really sets us back. It doesn't move us forward. From a political standpoint, as far as like the, the movement to empower Latinos and, and other minorities, don't you think it would be better if they voted for it on the floor of the Senate, straight up and down, and then maybe you worked it that way, and you, you picked off specific senators and tried to push them to do it? Because if it gets tucked into the budget, I mean, it's Listen. great. It gets happens. It's great, but at the same time, a vote on the floor and you can convince a Republican Senate to do it could could embolden 
the movement and, and, and like catapult um, you know Latino and Hispanic communities well, into like bigger issues. I'm committed, and I've said that I am very committed, and I've already started, you know, to build relationships with some of these organizations at a national level that are looking to mobilize the Latino community, that are looking for candidates to run, whether at local or state levels. You know, 2016 is going to be extremely, extremely important for the Latino community uh, in terms of what our role is going to be in the elections, not only at the presidential, that's important, but also at other local level races. And so I'm going to give up myself to make sure that I get out there and energize the base and get, help people uh, register to vote and explain the importance of them engaging in the political process. And all we can do is, is hope for that. We do need to organize at a local level and make sure that our community isn't taken for granted at any place. And wherever there are pockets of Latinos that can make or break a, uh, you know, an, a, a, a candidate in terms of, of whether they win or not, we want to flex that muscle, and we need to. And it's we had the greatest number of Latinos voting in the last presidential election. We're still not fully realizing our potential, but we can keep moving the dial forward, and it is going to be the decisive vote. Before we let you go, actually, when we were in Somos in Puerto Rico, Harrison Tok spoke to you about El Caño Martin Peña, yes. and you took a lot of your council member colleagues out to see it. I just wanted to see if there's any developments or movements on, on the, the push there, to get... Yeah. Yes, after that, we actually, uh, and based on conversations we had engaged with, with Senator Gillibrand, Senator Gillibrand took some of our colleagues, Senate and congressional reps, to El Caño after that visit that we made. Um, there's been a lot of movement. There is some pressure, additional pressure we need to bring to the Army Corps of Engineers because there is an approval that they need to provide in order to move forward um, with, with checking out, doing some additional studies that have to be made uh, and providing additional resources. So there has been some movement on level of interest that we're engaging, level of support. Um, we want to raise greater visibility. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out how, you know, how ways leading up to the Puerto Rican Day Parade that we can use those <laughs> forums to raise awareness about El, El Caño Martin Peña. Uh, but it is really something that we need to, to lend our help and our assistance to. I, I spoke to the um, uh, mayor last week, last Saturday. We, we talked about some of these things. She was supposed to come here. I don't know if she actually made it. She has some scheduling problems. But we Mayor addressed San Juan, you Mayor San Juan, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Same, we're talking about Carmen Yulín Cruz, yes. Mayor of San Juan. We did speak about it. We did cover it. We're, she's very passionate about it. She briefed me on some of those things, conversations that are going on. I expect her to actually interview here, but I, I don't know what happened with the scheduling, so I don't know if she came or not. But I know that you've been on this. Yes. Uh, but you opened the door to 2016. This is going to be my exit oh. question. <laughs> because you talked about, I know you're involved, I know you're pushing candidates, but there's always the rumor, suspicion, the bochinche, the, the political gossip of what you're going to do. I don't know why, because you're still serving in the city council, but you have an account open. There are people saying, you know, Congress, is she going to run for Congress? Are you going to run against Charlie Rangel the 13th? Are you going to run against Jose Zerano in a primary? Uh, or are you staying put? You're laughing, you're smiling, you're just that like... Well, um, Juan Manuel Benitez interviewed me earlier this week on the press. Right. He was sending in for the Brian Letter, Letter Show, I'm sorry. Right. And I specifically, explicitly said, I will not consider any position that would have me leave the speakership early. You know, my run is through 2017, December of 2017. The congressional seats open, that, that is coming up is in 2016. That means I would have to leave the speakership early. Right. I'm not interested in that. I've been doing a lot of great work. Um, this is an incredible opportunity for me and for the Latino community to have me in this position. There's a, still a lot of work to do, and I want to work with my colleagues to move that agenda forward. Do you think that, that then why, as Speaker of the City Council and, a rep and representing a City Council district, East Harlem, should be, why should you be concerned about the national elections in 2016 when there's so much to do in New York, and which is... Unless there's there is, I mean, you know, we we can juggle. There's, you can uh, you juggle. Know, you, okay. I can I can right. walk and chew gum at okay. the same time. Oh, I'm, I know you can do that, um, <laughs> but there's always a purpose. No, no, because I really feel passionately about. It. All we have to do is look okay. at what's happening at the congressional level. Look at the level of stagnation, inaction. Look at how um you know how dysfunctional it is. Look at how it makes us look as a country. It is the conversation and the level of conversation that is happening at that level at that you know in the congressional. Um, and, and the Senate is, is terrible. It's not, you know, so anything that I can do to change that dynamic um, and to help support get a Democrat to the presidency, I'm going to do. And I want to make sure that us as Latinos are not taken for granted and that our voices are heard. So anything I can do to push that forward, I'm going I'm to I'll leave you with I'll leave it with this one. Uh, there's been a, a tremendous amount of attention to the private emails versus the public emails of, of ex-secretary uh, uh, Clinton. Uh, 
What's your position on what Hillary has done? Has she handled this? Have you spoken to her about no, that? No, no. I mean, I haven't spoken to her. Uh, it's obviously, I think it's somewhat of a distraction. Uh, is, it, is it overblown? I, I always think it is. Uh, in, that <laughs> sen you know, in that sense, I think it is. I think there's more important issues, and it's right. being handled. I know that the agencies are handling it, and it's going through its process. But in terms of how the Republicans are responding to it, uh, and what they're trying to do with the whole Benghazi thing, and trying to resurface right, that, right, right. Um, I think that it is a distraction, and, and I think it's not productive. Right. Speaker of the New York City Council, Nadisa Mark Viverito, uh, thanks for stopping Thank by City so and State TV sure. and being at Somos. And, uh, Best of luck. There you go. And uh, you've got to read her piece in here because she very doesn't good. pull any punches. She <laughs> uses the words very appropriately. And uh, there are other interesting op-eds here, but got to read Melissa's uh, interesting op-ed and how she pinpoints to what the power structure here is and what this conference is all about. Gracias. Thank you, Melissa. Gracias. Gracias. Take care. Thank you so much.